Hey, look, my garden's uncovered again. So a few days ago, I worked on removing the shade cloth over my plants. And as you can see, everything is directly exposed to sunlight. And because of that, I now have to prepare working on my landscapes, which I would be starting to do later this month, at the end of the month. Unfortunately, I have to wait until then because I have lots of stuff that I need to do in preparation for any groundwork, any landscape work. And that has mostly to do with moving around some plants and deconstructing my planter box. To that end, I went and bought this raised planter beds from Bunnings. As you can see, these are quite, quite deep, good enough for certain types of plants. And I guess it would drain well. All of the water would be flowing out of the legs. So what I'm going to do is to fill this up with soil and transfer all of my ground cover, the plants that used to be in that planter over there, and plant them inside these raised planters. And of course, that means that I would need to spend a bit of time preparing my soil. So in this episode, we're going to talk about my soil mix and what's the best type of soil for these plants. Like most things in life, there's no silver bullet, no miracle cure, no panacea, no one-size-fits-all solution. There's no best of the best. Everything is so subjective. There's only the best for your situation. And that's the first thing I would like to stress when thinking about your soil mix. We have this saying in photography that the best camera is the one that you have with you. There's no use having a top-of-the-line camera if you don't bring it around anyway. What works for me may not necessarily work for you, especially if we have different climates and different types of plants and we water differently. There's a lot of variables involved here. So unless you do everything the same way that I do and you live in a climate that's exactly the same as mine, and even so, if you have the exact same types of plants and the exact same maturity of plants, Basically, if you reduce, remove all variables, then sure, why not copy what I do? But failing all of that, most likely, then you'll have to think about how each variable works and play around with it. So this video is going to be all about that. So reiterating the first point, your choice of soil mix should be reflective of your circumstances, your situation. Like I said earlier, you would have to consider your climate, which in turn, influences what type of plants would grow in your area and apart from that you'd also need to take note of your location the amount and quality of sunlight that you get the average temperature range which is of course these are all part of your climate you'll also have to check the availability your access to certain types of materials which you would be using to aggregate with your soil that's if you do not use pre-made soil mixes and apart from that you would have to consider the needs of the plant this varies from climate to climate and of course the genera and even the species of plants and to some extent you would even need to consider the type of container that you're using where you're planting them say you're using raised beds or pots or even doing the same as i planting them in the ground all of those are variables that you have to consider and one thing that people often overlook is your financial capability because this ultimately dictates whether or not you're able to afford all of those exotic materials so basically your soil mix is a compromise of all of those factors so again what i think is best might not necessarily be the best for you this might be a very controversial topic for some a lot of people swear by different types of materials i'm not going to start a pc versus mac debate <coughs> pc master race so what we have to do here is to inspect each variable and see how they interact with others when considering your soil there's a few factors that you have to keep in mind the first one would be the components which in turn is closely tied to water retention and nutrients and lastly the soil ph so for the components part of this this is one of the things that's very hotly debated in various forums online and as i've been saying people swear by various materials some swear by pumice some swear by scoria others would be recommending vermiculite perlite whatever so to expand on that, let's look at typical components used for soil mixes. A typical soil mix is composed of organic and inorganic materials. For the organic part, this is usually easy. We are just referring to the soil part of the composition. You might see this come in various names such as loam soil, topsoil, garden soil, potting mix. It largely depends on your location because 
say for instance here in Australia, we only call them garden soil, or at least what, that's what the garden centers label them. And garden soil, I think, would be the equivalent of what the U.S. would call topsoil. And essentially, topsoil, like the name implies, is the soil at the top layer in the ground. And loam is typically a composition where there's an equal mix, equal parts of sand, compost, and whatever. I think there's an equal di distribution, basically. But all those technical parts aside, I'm just going to consider topsoil or garden soil as the same thing. So basically, if I just went down to my garden, grab some handful of the top, then this would be the garden soil or the topsoil. Other possible organic stuff that I've heard people use would be charred rice hull, which you might encounter being called as carbonized, which basically means burning it, just charring it, turn, turning it to ash or charcoal. If you use fresh materials such as wood chips or twigs or whatever, then they tend to be more acidic as they decompose and we're going to discuss that later but basically you would want a fairly neutral soil maybe even slightly acidic but for the most part you do not have to worry about that because most of the soil available is neutral to slightly acidic which is perfect and as for the inorganics these are the components of the soil which do not decompose or rot and typically these are minerals rocks basically and there's a lot of contention, a lot of debate around this side. So let's just list some of them. We would have scoria, pumice, river pebbles, perlite, vermiculite, and sand. There would be many others very similar to this, such as zeolite, crashed marble, all sorts of stuff. I can't remember them off the top of my head. But basically, all of these fall into one of a few categories of uh, aggregates. The first category of aggregates is what I would like to call vesiculated rock. These are basically rocks that have lots of air pockets between them. Good examples of this would be scoria, pumice, any type of volcanic rock. For all intents and purposes, they are all the same, only they have a varying percentage of air pockets by, by density, by volume. In my case, I usually use scoria. Scoria has lots of air pockets inside of it. But if you compare it to pumice, pumice would have lots more air, air gaps and they're so light that they tend to float sometimes. Compared to scoria, which is more dense due to less, having less amount of air pockets. So again, th that first category would be vesiculated rocks or rocks with bubbles, air pockets inside of them. The next category would be rocks without air pockets. Under that, you could consider river pebbles, crushed rock, maybe chips, marble chips, whatever, granite, sandstone, limestone, anything, basically. As long as they are not porous, they do not have those air pockets, air bubbles inside of them, then this would be the next category. I think you might even have to consider sand as part of this. They're all basically the same, it's just a matter of the grade of the material. So I guess there's just two. If you place them into very general categories, it would be vesiculated versus non-vesiculated. If you take any of these rocks and mix them into your soil mix, this would allow you to break apart your soil, especially if it's sandy or clayey. And right away, mixing pebbles would create lots of air pockets between the soil. If you use enough of these pebbles, regardless of whether it's vesiculated or non-vesiculated, then you would end up with a very well-draining mix, a very loose mix. And it all boils down into how much of these materials you should use whether you could afford them, whether you could easily source them, and that should be a huge factor in your decision. So when picking what to use, the first thing that should come into your mind is its availability. So there's no point trying to source something that's really hard to come by, because by then that means that they would be a lot more expensive, whether that would be the base price itself or the cost of transporting them to your location. So I really recommend starting with something that's locally available. Now I'm lucky that Soilworks, where I get my all of my pebbles from, they are close by. I could just drive over or even have them deliver. So it's really convenient for me, which is why I stuck with them. Now a close second consideration would be the price and it's closely tied to availability. Because of course there's the supply versus demand problem. Some materials would be a lot cheaper compared to the others. An, an example would be scoria. I think in my location scoria is really cheap. It might not be the same in other places. If you try sourcing the same amount of scoria and perlite by volume, then you would find that the perlite costs a lot more 
compared to Scoria. Again, that's based on my location. I'm not sure how things are in your area. There's no way for me to know. So you have to do this comparisons yourself. Now taking those first two decisions, which is the availability versus price, this gives you a rough idea of the amount, the quantity that you could work with. And this has to match with your purpose. In my case, I plant in the ground and in pots and in planters, which means that I need, I require a huge amount. If you're solely doing this in pots, then you would need less materials than I, which means that you might get away with using more expensive materials. Maybe you only need a few bags of them. In my case, a few bags wouldn't cut it. I need entire trucks of it. Another factor that should be part of your decision is the drainage. Drainage and water retention. This part is closely tied with your climate and your watering routine. If you live in a similar climate as I, where it does not rain every day, it's fairly dry on average, although we do get the occasional heavy downpours basically not tropical, temperate, then you could get away with a slightly moisture retentive mix. But if you live closer to the tropics where it's constantly humid, it's almost always wet, there's a lot of rain, lots of rainfall, then you would want something that retains less moisture and drains a lot more easily. And that decision again ties back to the first two of the availability and price. If you want to decrease the moisture retention and increase the drainage, then you will have to include a lot more of the orga inorganic materials into your soil mix. Regardless of what you decide to use, in my case, it is scoria because it's easily available here. The one thing that you have to do is the wet clump test. Basically, take your soil mix, soak it in water, take a clump and make sure it just crumbles. Because if it sticks together, then it's no good. Because it means that the next time you drench your soil, there's little drainage. Your drainage is not as efficient. And your plants would be wet longer than they should be. Let's go ahead and do that test. Now here's an example of something less ideal. There's not much inorganic materials in this sample. The clump remains intact, it does not break down by itself. This is no good. Out of curiosity, I decided to go out and grab a bag of vermiculite and a bag of perlite just to be able to compare against my scoria mix. Going back to those considerations, I mentioned availability and price. These two are readily available, I can find them in most of the shops. As for the price tag, each of these bags cost about eight or nine dollars and that's only for five liters quite small with scoria for the same price i could get about 20 liters i think which is about four times this amount so i don't think these are cost effective but we'll see what they look like
Comparing those three mixes, you would see right off the bat the differences between the three. With the perlite mix, they still clump a bit, but unlike the, the base soil that I have, which really clumps, at least it breaks it down a little bit. Only problem here is that the perlite particles, each grain, they tend to float and they tend to fly away with a little bit of breeze. So it might be problematic if I use it in the ground. It might be something you could use if you're going to use it in pots, but unfortunately, it's not for me. I see more or less the same thing with vermiculite, only the vermiculite does not fly as easily compared to the perlite. It's a bit denser, a bit heavier. Compared to the base soil, it breaks it down a little. It can get clumpy at times, but nothing out of the ordinary. Comparing the two, I think I would prefer vermiculite over perlite. And all things the same, they are being sold at the same price here. Now you would argue that perlite and vermiculite are not supposed to be used by themselves. You would have to mix them with other materials such as peat, coir, pumice, other rocks. But again, that defeats the point because in my case, I'm going for a larger quantity. And having that sort of mix would make it more expensive since I would have to grab a lot more materials. You know, I like to keep it really simple. I just have two components in my mix. It's just regular soil and scoria. And for my use, for my requirements, they satisfy the wet clump test and they're easy to source. I also find them to be very cost effective because scoria, I could get a lot more scoria for the same price as one small bag of the vermiculite and perlite. And even if you consider looking at premium pre-made cactus and succulent potting mix, then I think here they sell those for $12 a bag, a uh, 25 or 20 liter bag. For $12, I could buy a bag of regular soil for about $250 to maybe $5 in Scoria, and it would still end up being cheaper than the premium mix. So this is why I tend to mix my own rather than go with pre-made ones. The other thing that the, the pre-made ones are good for is that they already contain some nutrients some fertilizers and this might be another argument in itself we're going to discuss that in the next episode fertilizers but the thing is succulents do not need as much nutrients in the first place anyway especially if you're starting with a rich soil base like i am it's your regular topsoil compost mix lawn mix so it's rich enough that i would even use it for my for my vegetables in fact that's what we're doing here so my method in all of this is that i take a rich soil base and mix it with scoria and that's it. So my take in all of this is that you should focus on something that you could sustain, something sustainable, something that you could easily source and something that would not break the bank. At least that's my priorities. I need to be cost efficient since I'm using a huge quantity of soil. Things might be different in your circumstances and it's not right of me to impose my method on you. And this is something that you have to dig deep down, reach inside yourself and see what your priorities are, what your requirements are. In order for you to determine what's the best soil mix, all you have to do is determine what your conditions are, what your requirements are, and match them with the materials that's available. How much you spend is entirely up to you, but it pays to know what the options are. Be wise about your soil mix. And I'll leave you with that. In the next episode, we're going to talk about fertilizers, and I'll see you then. Bye. Special thanks to all of my Patreon supporters, especially Oscarino, Judy Seal, Snap Kui, Gloria Ninotti, Camila Rice, Linda Leal, Gwen Ott, Q2, Jesse May, and Ronin Perez. Thank you so much. Without your help, a lot of this is not possible. You should also check out my website, seriescafes.com. I have a plant shop and Seriescapedia section right there. I push updates once in a while, so make sure to check back from time to time. And finally, follow me on Instagram, that's at Seriescapades. I post a photo of an Echeveria every single day under the hashtag Daily Echeveria. 